How many of you are going to let something get a hold of you this evening or this morning? Amen? I'm ready. I'm ready for something to get a hold of me. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm looking forward to this morning. It's been a long time coming, but uh, excited about having Jeff Dove with us here this morning. Uh, he was supposed to be here last year, but his wife was having some health issues, and he had to send in a, a replacement. Edgar Reed came in, did a great job last year, and, and uh, a couple years before that, it seemed like we had another incident, but, but we actually got him in the flesh this morning, and uh, I, I'm so gr glad, you know, because some of you might know this and some of you might not, but Jeff and I were uh, classmates in college. And we got the same hairdo, just I cut mine a little shorter than his, and uh, we, we go to the same barber. <laughs> they don't like that. Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Anyhow, Jeff, Jeff and his wife, Michelle, were, uh, were actually in the building that we were in. When Don and I were married, we were in uh, college together, and he was uh, living upstairs in uh, the apartment buildings there and, and we became friends. I used to cook out on the grill and he kept coming by and the odor from the, the chicken that was cooking on the grill kept getting into <laughs> and he would come and he'd just drool over the balcony and <laughs> until we had to invite him down and, and uh, actually we, we become friends and had a great fellowship together in college. Later in life uh, he was called out of the pastoral ministry into missions and uh, began missionary, and you were serving in Laos first, is that right? And from Laos, he was brought back into Bangkok and became the area director over five uh, different nations, isn't it five? Five. And over in Thailand, uh, it was Laos, Burma, or, or you can straighten me out when I get done, okay? And uh, anyhow, while he was there, our daughter, Rebecca, was being called into missions, and so trying to determine whether that was the call or not, she went for a two-year term as a missionary associate to Bangkok and served as his, uh, basically, secretary, working in his office there in ministry, trying to see if this is where God, and we thought that was just a temporary assignment as far as going to Bangkok. We didn't know that God was calling her around the other side of the world for eternity, and, uh, well, not eternity, at least until, until she goes home to be with the Lord, at least at this point. And so he stole our daughter from us. And uh, I'm so glad to have him in my house because I can treat him like I want to now. And, uh, and just, well, will you welcome Jeff Dove? Come on, Jeff. Let's get him going here. Amen. Can you say amen? Isn't it good just to hear your preacher lie once in a while? <laughs> that way you know he's just like you. <laughs> Tough crowd. Turn to your neighbor and say, tell your face you're a Christian. <laughs> Some of you are going to do it. <laughs> well, you're nothing if not obedient. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Good to sense the presence of the Lord. It's... Uh, I long ago put, put away the spirit of religion from my life. In fact, I really don't like religion. Religion is what's tearing up the Middle East right now. Religion is what keeps people out of these churches. Religion is what has driven many a, a seeker of the Lord Jesus Christ away. Religion is never what he called us to. We are not saved by the blood of bulls and goats, nor by precepts, nor by promises, nor by anything that man can devise. We are saved by the incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. And he said, I love you just the way you were when you were in sin. How much more am I going to love you now? How much more will I not freely pour out upon you all that you need and all that I possess? The Bible says that God is our Father, He's our Abba Father, but now that I've had the privilege of being a grandpa for eight years, and we've got, uh, what do we got, five and one in the cooker still, so we've got six little grandkids, I think God can be better likened to a grandpa. <laughs> he, is, he loves us that much. He won't put up with stuff, He'll correct us, He'll discipline us, 
But at the end of the day, I can go into his presence as we were just being led in song by our great worship team this morning. I can come into his presence with confidence, knowing that he loves me, knowing that he loves me. Whether I had a tie on or I don't have a tie on, whether I'm, I'm a member of this church or not, I'm just visiting no matter what color I am, no matter what my economic status, no matter who I am, I am beloved of the Father. Amen? That means something to me. That's my retirement account. My MBA is secure. I won't tell you how much interest I got, but <laughs> the Bible says he's going to give me 30, 60, and 100 fold. I bet you wish you could get that. Father, help us. Before we start drifting and preaching a regular sermon today, help me to just stay focused on my task. I love being in your house. I love being with your children. I love Pastor and Miss Donna, Lord, and their family. The legacy that they're leaving in this town and among these people with this building, but also with the building that's not built by hands, this congregation that's being created here for your glory, Lord. I, I bless the efforts in Hilliard, Florida, and Peninsular, Peninsula, Florida District. Father, we ask today that you touch our hearts. For the next few moments, as I, I quote some scripture and I tell some story, Lord, help us to once again together make a difference in places of the world that are not being touched, places of the world that are yet to hear what we so ably have heard today already. Anoint us once again, sir, by your Holy Spirit. Let him flow within us and through us and around us until, like my dear sister sang this morning, I can leave this place saying, something got a hold of me. <laughs> something got a hold of me, and I've been changed. I've been altered. I've become more like Jesus. Help us today, Lord, to that end, and we'll make sure that you get the glory and you get all the honor. We pray it in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. So be it. I am, as Pastor, Pastor Johns has just said, we've been friends for 150 years. Uh, and it was a friendship formed over chicken. That's the truth. Uh, we couldn't afford to turn our air conditioner on in Bonnie Apartments, also known as Little Jerusalem down in Lakeland, Florida. So we had the, we had the windows open and the fan going. And how many of you know when barbecued chicken is on the grill? Um, it kind of wafts upward, just like the, the prayer of the saints, as pastor's teaching you about in Revelation. The prayer of the saints came as an offering before me, <laughs> and I went out to the balcony, and I looked down, and I didn't see Bathsheba. I saw Arlie Johns. And I said, yea, Lord, I am tempted. <laughs> I am tempted to form friendship with that man because he has the anointing of barbecued chicken. <laughs> it just went all over him. <laughs> and uh, we've been eating chicken together ever since, haven't we, Pastor? <laughs> Uh, it's a good thing. It's a good, good thing. It's good to have friends where you can just be yourself, but also to share in the goodness of the Lord. And when we got problems, we can share it, but when we got good things, we can share it too. And no one thinks you're whining, and no one thinks you're bragging. We're just happy, and we hurt together. Well, today I'm here to present to you the ministry that God has called us to recently, which is creating fire Bibles in different languages of the world. Uh, I, I really never thought I'd be leading this type of an organization. I'm not really gifted at organization. I, I, I never studied management flow or mid-level management processes, and, and I'm not good at building teams or, or that kind of a thing. You can take one look at my desk and say, how in the world does anything ever get done in this process? I love vision casting. I love looking on the fields, for they are wide unto harvest and telling you to go get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good at that kind of stuff, but God has a sense of humor, so he called me, who was the least of the apostles of organization, to lead an organization that's touching literally nearly 100 nations around the world today. And I thank God for that. It's definitely an honor to represent him in that fashion. You say, what in the world is a fire Bible, Jeff? What is the difference between a fire Bible and a regular Bible? Well, here in the States, you can still buy them in English. We, don't, we produce Bibles, but we don't sell them. We don't retail them. I can tell you after service how you can get them. This is not a commercial. I don't make any money off of them at all, but you can still buy them online at different places in English. It's called the Full Life Study Bible or Life in the Spirit Application Bible, and now they're even known as the International Fire Bible here in the U.S., but it's a study Bible that on every single page of the Bible has notes at the bottom of the page explaining difficult concepts in the Scripture or talking about the major themes of what God is trying to say in that passage. It also has center references 
on each one of the pages that tell you if you're reading, if you're reading uh, the 23rd Psalm, the first verse, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It'll send you other places to talk about the shepherding aspect of God in your life. And, and then there are 77 handwritten articles by great leaders of the faith, Don Stamps and Stanley Horton, among others, who are great Pentecostal leaders in the house of God through the years. And they've written articles on what it means to be a Christian, what it means to put sin out of your life. What is true water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives utterance? What are signs and wonders? What are angels? What are demons? All the typical questions that new believers in Christ will have. And you say, well, Jeff, that's kind of why we have church. Arlie Johns knows all the answers, so if we have a question, pastor will tell us. Well, how many of you know that in most of the places of the planet, where the, where the kingdom of God is being birthed and is in brand new fields of harvest, there are no pastors. There are no churches. There's limited access to anyone who has any knowledge of some of those articles and commentaries that I've just explained to you about. We're building one of our languages of our Bible. It's called the Shungan language, which is a language that's spoken in northern South Africa, Mozambique, and some parts of Zimbabwe, Africa. And uh, it's, been, it's been demonstrated to us there that as the Spirit of God is moving and people are getting saved, uh, much like our sister said, they just go to a meeting under a tamarisk tree or, or a, a big spreading tree out on the savanna. They get saved, and two weeks later, they're pastoring a church. How many of you know there's nothing more dangerous than an untrained Pentecostal preacher? <laughs> it's a scary thing. <laughs> it seemeth good to me and the Holy Ghost, and you've got to have a little knowledge that's backed up with that. The Bible says test the spirits, not test the spirit, but test the spirits. And so what we endeavor to do with these, these language Bibles that have all of these helps and all of these encouragements, all of these explanations, is to put in the hands, especially of the emerging church, that's not a phrase we use too often here now, but of a church that's just being formed in the world, many places restricted access people groups, we put these Bibles into their hands, and we call them a one-book Pentecostal library into the hands of, of new leaders. And I found that once the new leaders get it, the old leaders are kind of jealous of it, and they want it too. And they start looking through it, and they said, I never knew that. I never, never, ever knew that. Well, you know, our, our biggest fire Bible, as far as the numbers of them, the pastor has one in his office here as well. But we several years ago, we printed, we produced and printed over 3 million Bibles in the Chinese Mandarin language, the simplified language of mainland China alone. I don't know if, if you realize how many Bibles, three million Bibles are, you couldn't put them in this room stacked from the floor to the ceiling, and they're very small, compact books. Three million books is a lot of books to get into a country where it's not legal to get them in. So they took them through Mongolia, they took them through Russia, they took them through Hong Kong, they took them across the borders of northern Burma into southwest China. We did them by hook, by crook, in suitcase, and backpack, and uh, we still got a couple of containers, one hung up in Hong Kong and one hung up in Mongolia, but we've got just except for those two containers, three million copies of the Word of God with all the notes and explanations to that exploding church in mainland China. Can you say amen? Our partnership enabled us to do that together. Every one of those Bibles, we don't do that with all the context, but every one of those Bibles were given to house church leaders in the fastest growing church on the planet. You say, Jeff, how important was it? Well, let me tell you, you can be Pentecostal and still be wrong. Do you know that? <laughs> Some of you do. <laughs> Stick around. You'll learn a lot of things today you may not have heard before. You can be Pentecostal and still be mistaken. You can still be Pentecostal and not really have heard. If you're pastoring a church and you've never owned your own personal Bible, can you imagine that? Not just that you're a, a born-again believer, not just that you're new to the city, not just that you're new to the Christian faith, but you're pastoring a group of people at many times thousands in that network, and they hadn't even owned their own personal copy of the Scriptures. They were passing handwritten copies of the books of the gospel and some of the books of Psalms and, and, and pieces of the book of Revelation and, and different ones back and forth. We've got a full handwritten copy in Mandarin Simplified Chinese in our office, in our archive office, to keep as a, as a, as a reliquary, if you will, of what we've been able to replace and put in the hands of pastors. 
And uh, so error just kind of abounds in that situation. That's where we had the barking revival. When the Spirit of God comes on you, you must bark like a dog. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if you know, I've howled a time or two, and I've barked a time or two, but I don't necessarily think it's in the book that you have to bark like a dog when the Spirit of God comes on you. But if you don't have anything to check that stuff by, that's why the Scripture tells us, we as who are called into ministry, study to show thyself approved, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth, that you're not, you won't be ashamed in what you're doing. You won't have to go back and say, wow, I was wrong. You don't have to bark like a dog. You might speak in tongues, and you might fall down, and you might give an offering once in a while as the Spirit of God moves on you. Can you say Amen. But you don't have to bark. That'd be a great place to say amen. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you don't have to bark. So we, we, we have had the privilege of working with those around the world. Let me just share with you the, the additions that are coming so you can see the scope of the partnership that Pastor is leading you into here. See if I can make this technology work. I'm, I'm the least of the apostles of technology, too. These are the languages that we're currently working in to finish, Lord willing, before his return. We're working on the Croatian language, Ilocano, Punjabi, Japanese, South and North Korean Old Testament, the Singhalese, the Shongan, the Lingala, the Lisu, which I'll talk about today, the, the Sagal Karin, the Hmong, Vietnamese. Praise God, after nine and a half years, the Vietnamese is going to be finished this year. Can you say amen? The Italian, the Greek, the Hebrew. Hebrew is finished next month. I will, next month at this time, I will be in the holy city of Jerusalem and also down in Haifa. And they have their very own fully annotated Bible in the Hebrew language now. We're going to put it in the hands of believers in those two cities. And that's because we did that together. I'm not here to ask you for another penny. It's already paid for. And we're having them shipped in. That's going to be a great time. I'm sorry. I'm happy about that. The Urdu language of the people of Pakistan, Farsi, which is the main language in, in Iran, the, the Chinese kids simplified is being done, Armenian, Nepali, and pidgin languages. All of those we're working on right now in those, those countries, if you're aware of any of those languages, they're spread all over the world. I don't speak any of those languages. So thank God he's helped us to form great partnerships with our national church, with our missionaries, with pastors like, like Pastor John's who believe in the vision. They fund it. They help us. We connect with people. We locate local men and women of God who will translate for us and edit and correct and uh, the difficult task of formatting Bibles, putting them together, businessmen that come in behind us and pay for the printing of these thousands of volumes of Bibles. How many of you know a book this big costs a lot to get printed, doesn't it? The first Bible of any language cost us about $400,000. Can you say, oh my? <laughs> $400,000 is our average. We've had one that's gone nearly a million, and others we've gotten done for as low as $300,000. But on the average, four hundred dollars to four and a quarter it takes to get the first one done. After that, they're about twelve dollars to $13 a piece. Thank God for those ones that come after. We'll just skip the first one and go straight to the second ones and beyond. But that first one is our, is our very first prototype, and thank God we've been able to do that. I have here today, and you can look at it after service if you want. I'm very, very proud of this. It came from... My activity in the nation of Cambodia over the last 20 years. This is the this is the Fire Bible in the Khmer, the Khmer language depends on which aspect you like to use, or the the language of the people of Cambodia. If you're familiar with the story of the killing fields, where somewhere between 1.8 to 2.2 million people were slaughtered in the space of just a little over two years, the heartbreak of that country and the fact that people said you'll never, ever, ever be able to establish a church in that country because of the residual effects of, of, of fast-paced communism and, and genocide and the heavy influence of animism and Buddhism in, in, that, in that culture. But we planted a Bible school some years ago with uh, Randy and Carolyn Dorsey, and people just like you helped us to buy the land and build the building before we ever had a single student. We had land in a building. Can you imagine that? That's either faith or stupidity. It just depends on how long you stay with it. But we had the land and we had the building up, and God began to send the students. Uh, this wasn't any of my plan to share, but it just shows you. When God gives you a vision and you know that you've heard from God, if you walk in obedience, he'll start bringing the pieces together to make that happen. If you wait for everything to be perfect, how many of you know you'll never get anything done? 
I walked in this building when it was a total mess <laughs> in this building right here. I was in here when, when you, you, had, you couldn't come in barefoot because you get screws in the bottom of your foot. And, and it was dirty and it was dusty and it was noisy. And it was, it, I just looked around and I never saw this in this place. But your pastor saw it. It was in his heart. It was in his mind. And he said, I'm going to do this if it kills me and if it kills you. <laughs> We're going to do this. And I just, I walked through this building today with pastor and I'm just like, I never saw this looking like this. And I've watched you online. I don't know if you realize you guys are online on Sunday mornings. Most of you can't be seen, so don't worry about getting your, picking your nose or anything because all they can basically see is just right up here around the front. And, but I watch you. I watch your pastor. I listen to him to make sure he's preaching the word of truth. I've seen him. Him big old hands of his look like they're reaching right out to get you on the camera. <laughs> he's got bear paws. But I never saw this, but he did, and he had a vision. He had a vision. We had a vision in Cambodia of doing just that with a, with a Bible school, and one day as they were finishing up the building, even before we had our very first student, there was an old man came through. The, everything in Cambodia has to be walled, or people will come in and squat on your property, and then you, it's a big, big problem to get them off your property. So we had the walls built and everything, but somehow he got past the guard. Old man, I'm, I'm going to say in his late 70s, early 80s. That's old in that context for sure. And he came in and he grabbed an old, uh, we, we call it a broom. They would call it a rake in their language, but it's a combination of uh, very stiff uh, thatch. And they tie it onto a piece of stick. It looks like a big long broom. And, and he's sweeping up the leaves and sweeping up the debris and putting them all up around because right in the middle of that compound, they had put a three-ring a three ring dais of concrete up out of the gravel there and put a stone cross up in the middle, which was extremely irrelevant to the Cambodian society. They didn't have any idea what it meant. And he's out there working, and for a couple of days, the missionaries and the contractors thought he was just someone that somebody had hired because they needed to work and wanted some food. And, and so someone went over, I believe it was Kelly Robinette, went over and asked him because he speaks Cambodian very well, and he called him uncle. That's a term of respect in Cambodian culture. He says, uncle? Um, who, who are you working for? Who's your supervisor? And he says, I have no supervisor. And he said, well, who are, why are you working here? He said, I just wanted to be close to that thing right there. And he pointed at the cross, didn't even know the word for it. And he says, what do you mean you want to be close to that? He said, when I was a young boy, I had a dream that there would come a time when that symbol would be in my home village. And when I saw that symbol, that I was to come to this place and give the rest of my life in service. He didn't know Christ. He didn't know the cross. He didn't know Christianity. He knew that he had a dream and that when it came to pass, as surely as he was alive, he needed to go. And so he was just there sweeping in the house of God. Even before he knew what it meant, they took Uncle in. They fed him. They cleaned him up. They put him on staff with a paycheck and led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he served on that capacity, grounds cleaning of that place to the very day he died. I want you to know he was glad someone had a vision to do something even before there was a physical need, even before there was a requirement. We've got 50 students. We need to have a building. No. How many of you know the time to build a boat is before you get in the water? The time to get something done is before you're in dire straits and need. And I believe that with all my heart. So we're building Bibles for cultures that don't even have a strong Christian church yet. They have not even responded historically in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I'm believing that my God is a God that's fixing to. God is fixing to pour out of His Spirit upon all flesh. On the Lisu tribes and the Hmong. And He's fixing to pour out of His Spirit across China like we've never seen before. He said in the last days, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Every flesh, everywhere, and all the nations of the world will hear this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the end shall come. This gospel will be preached as a witness unto all the world. It's going to happen. And if I believe in faith, I start paying it forward. I start working it forward. I start preparing for the day when revival is going to come. Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Several years ago, the Lord put it on my heart to begin preparing Bibles just like this for tribal peoples, not countries, but tribal languages. You say, Jeff, what in the world is a tribal people, a tribal language? It's simply a, a body of people who speak. They're bound together by shared culture, similar languages, 
and, uh, but they don't have a country. They, this would be, the Kurds would fall into this. The Hmong, the Lisu, the Karin, the Kachin, the Wa, the, 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 the Montagnards, different ones that some of you may be familiar with are people of hundreds of thousands, the Romani, the Romani gypsies of, of Eastern Europe. They're tribal people that have no country, but they have an identity and they have a people. And if you don't focus on them, if you just focus on the nation of Thailand or the nation of Burma or the nation of Cambodia, you'll miss, you'll miss the people inside that country. Amen? There are invisible people. Jesus was famous for going right into a crowd and immediately identifying the invisible, the people that others weren't seeing. The woman with the issue of blood, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, the man sitting up in the tree named Zacchaeus that just wanted to get a peek of Jesus, and, and Joseph of Arimathea and other ones. Jesus was always looking at those. He saw potential in them, and he, he went to them. That's what we're trying to do as well. Several years ago, as I shared, God put it on my heart to not just build Bibles for strong national churches to use in their training programs, but also to send it and build it and have it ready for the times when God was going to pour out of His Spirit on all flesh. Years ago, God called us, as Pastor mentioned, called my wife and myself and our two little kids to the nation of Laos, and uh, we weren't professional missionaries. I'm still pretty much a sorry professional missionary. I don't have a program. I don't have a presentation. This will scare some of you literally to death, but I don't even have any notes this morning, so I don't know when to start, and I don't know when to stop. Is that scary or what? Pastor's not going to do that. He's got an outline for you tonight. He's a real man of God. <laughs> and I bless him for it in the name of Jesus. Different calling. <laughs> but I was not a professional missionary. I only had two classes in my entire academic career on missions. That was it. Two classes. It was the same class. I had to take it twice because I failed it the first time. I am not a professional missionary. My parents never went anywhere. They never, I mean, for a big vacation was going up to see the Blue Hole in northern Ohio. I mean, it's just a big water place in the middle of the, the state. That's it. You go, eat a, you go eat a little orange popsicle and you go home. That's how we went. I asked my daddy one time. I said, Dad, where's our roots from? Where does our family come from? He said, you know, I think if you go back a ways, you'll find out we came from Des Moines. <laughs> I was thinking maybe Poland or England or Germany. He said, no, 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 we came from Des Moines. I'm pretty sure from Iowa. We are very vanilla people in the Dove household. We'd never been anywhere, never did anything. My daddy built a little 1,027-square-foot house in Dayton, Ohio, back in 1951 or 52, and he's still there after all these years. I said, Daddy, won't you just sell this thing and get you a real house? He said, got everything I need. <laughs> it's got a nice garage. I don't have too much grass to cut. Your mom loves me. We're happy. Leave it alone. We are just not adventurous people. And I personally, as a pastor, had never been on a missions trip. I'd never been to Mexico. I never went to the Bahamas. I never went to, to some of the places we go to, to build churches in Costa Rica or, or, or Nicaragua. I'd never been to any of those places. When I took my church on a missions trip, we went to inner city Cleveland. Have you ever been to inner city Cleveland? They will kill you dead in a heartbeat in inner city Cleveland if you don't watch yourself. And people need Jesus here, so that's where we went. I'd never been anywhere, never done anything, didn't know the language, didn't know the culture, didn't know what we were doing, but I knew this. I'd heard in my heart, I am calling you to go there and don't worry about your abilities or your capabilities, for though the enemy is arrayed against you and the country is communist and the people speak a foreign language, I will fill you with my spirit and you will accomplish great and mighty things. And I was just naive enough to believe it. So I went. We just loaded it up, 11 suitcases, 7 carry-ons, and my wife's Mary Poppins purse, and off we went to the nation of, of Laos. And it, I won't go into describing what a difficult cultural transition that was for us. Some of you who are elderly here and you long for the good old days, you can have them. Because we lived it for two years in northern Laos. No toilet, no electricity, no running water, no Internet, no TV, no telephone, no nothing. One paved road in the entire province where we lived. They called it road number seven. Why they wouldn't call it road number one, I don't know. It was the only one with asphalt on it. Everything else was a dirt road. Roaches everywhere. Rats as big as your hand in the house with you. 
mosquitoes that would give you dengue fever and malaria and, and yellow fever and, and everything else. And it was cold in the winter and blazing hot in the summer and no air conditioners, no screens on the windows, no glass in the windows. I'm telling you, none of us in our right mind would want to go to a place like that. And besides that, the people weren't welcoming us, saying, Oh, Jeffrey, we just love that you've come to us. Please come in and share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with us. They didn't like Americans, and they didn't even know Christianity enough to not like Christianity. They just knew they'd never heard of it. We were the only people that spoke English in our entire province, except for two translators we hired, one for the governor so we could work for him and one to work for us. And neither one of those were born-again believers. It was, a, it was tough sledding. They had a, they had a, a, a I can't think in English. He was, a, um, he was an army guy. <laughs> Stood out in front of our house. Pastor was just describing to me about these little shop houses they have, and they roll up the, the metal gate in front of them. That's what we lived in. We lived in two of those together for two years, and they put a soldier in front of our house to keep us safe, <laughs> to keep us safe. He was watching us. They rotated him through, of course, day and night, had an AK-47 strapped on his back doing guard duty in front of my house so he could report on my every move. How many of you know that can be intimidating? I didn't like it. I did 12 years in the Army Reserve, and I didn't care for someone in front of my house with an AK so I went out there, and I was going to tell him a thing or two. You ever been there <laughs> where the spirit of aggravation just comes all over you? Some of you have. How many of you ever had kids, ladies? You're familiar with the spirit of aggravation. I know you are. <laughs> My mom used to get it regular. As soon as the spirit of God fell on her, she didn't speak in tongues. She was grabbing switches. <laughs> so we tried to pray the spirit of aggravation off of her. But it came on me big time, and I went out, and I told my translator, I said, you need to speak everything that I speak to this man. He said, well, what are you going to say? I said, you don't worry about it. You just tell him what I'm going to say. So I went out there, and I told him. Of course, I towered over him. He was about 4'11", 5 foot tall, didn't weigh 100 pounds, little bitty guy. How many of you ever in the service? Anyone in the military here? You know what standing guard duty is like. It's the most mind-numbing thing you can do in the military. After an hour or two hours, you're just standing there. You're just bored to tears. You're not trying to be macho, man. You're just trying to stay awake on your feet. And he's standing out there, bored to tears. And here's this big, hairy, fat, white guy that comes out and gets right in his face. And, and I said, sir, you're standing out here, and you're violating my rights, and you're scaring my family, which wasn't the truth. My kids thought it was cool. That was back before the, the iPhones and the cell phones and all that stuff. They had those. Remember those little throwaway Kodak plastic cameras you used to be able to buy? And uh, you just turned the whole camera in. They gave you your pictures back. Some of you are old enough to remember that. And they were taking pictures out the top. Top window. They thought it was cool, you know, that they had an army guy in front of their house. But I told him, he says, you're scaring my children to death, and, and I don't appreciate it. And I, I was getting ready to really give him what for. And uh, he starts looking around. He's looking to see if anyone's close enough to hear. And he tells my translator, he says, tell the big white guy that's yelling at me to just relax. They didn't give me any bullets. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought to myself later on, I said, isn't that just like the enemy? To put something in front of us and we attack it in the spirit and we're all afraid of it. And then we get mad at it and, and he has to confess, I don't even have any bullets. Well, it was a difficult situation to be in. But it was there that God birthed in our heart a love for the people that most, most Americans may never hear about. They may never know. We, we visited the Tai Dum people, the Tai Dang people, the Kamu people, the Hmong, the Lisu, the, the, the Viet Minh, the Lao Lum, Lao Sung, Lao Tung peoples that none of you may ever hear again after you leave this service. But they're real people for whom Jesus gave his life on an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. I believe he was fully man, but also believe he was fully God when he died on that cross. And he says, I did this for everyone that is and that will come. I'm pouring out my life for you. I began to say, Lord, there's got to be a way. Got to be a way to help. Well, after about three months, they quit. They took the army guy away from our house. And they started just putting, every, they said, every time you leave your home, you have to have someone from the Department of Education go with you in your car. So if I wanted to take a drive out to take a picnic, 
had to have a communist with me. If I wanted to go to the grocery store, it wasn't a store, but there was a market. If I wanted to go to the market, communist official went with me. I went to visit the schools we were building, communist guy went with me. At the time, I chafed under that discipline, and I, I failed to see that sometimes the Lord puts people in your realm to influence and to witness to, even if you don't want them there. <laughs> and uh, so I had this man, he started going with us, his name is Somjai, and Somjai was about my same age and uh, was a tribal man. He wasn't a normal Lao person, tribal individual, but somehow I'd gotten a job in the government. He was part of the Communist Party, and he would ride with me, and he was trying to learn a little bit of English, so I was sharing with him, teaching me English, and he would teach me some Lao words, and we were basically learning to communicate, but any real meaning for conversation we had through a translator. And uh, we're riding in the car, and I could tell that he was very pensive that day. He was very, very quiet. And I wondered what was going on in his life, but I didn't have a real relationship with the man to be able to say, is there something I can pray for you about? Is what's going on? But we had talked a little bit about Christianity. We had talked a little bit about what it means to be a believer and a follower of Christ. Now, you've got to understand, there had never in the history of the world been a Christian church in this entire province. Not, not what we would call a Christian church. There had not been, in there, that, that day, there wasn't one among the tribals or the Lao people. It was totally devoid of any church there. And we're in that car, and we're driving, and we're about an hour and a half away from the house, up in the mountains on road number seven. And it's a very precarious mountain that winds, or road that winds through the mountains, and you can see some beautiful vistas of the mountains, the foothills of the Himalayan mountains up there in northern Laos. It's where we bombed. We dropped more tonnage of bombs on Siem Kwong and Huapan province in, in the Vietnam conflict. We dropped more tonnage of bombs on those two provinces alone than we did in, in World War II in Germany. Millions of tons of bombs, because that was right where the Ho Chi Minh Trail wound through those mountains. We're driving along about an hour and a half into it. He tells the driver, another loud person, he says, let's stop here. Let's stop right here. So the driver, of course, stopped. Here's a communist official in the car. He stopped. We got out, and I'm looking, thinking, well, maybe he's got to go to the bathroom. There are no gas stations. There are no rest stops. There's no 7-Elevens or that, what have you. We just, there's the jungle on the right and the jungle on the left, and there you go. So we got out. We're stretching our legs, and middle of nowhere, no traffic, just us in our Speed the Light Land Cruiser. Can you say amen for Speed the Light? <laughs> uh, never could have made it without him. We're standing there on the side of the road, and, and uh, Somjai squats down as only a true Asian can do. I can get down. I just can't get back up. But he squats down on his, on his haunches, and he's looking out over this jungle, and it's early morning. The sun is just hitting the canopy of the jungle, and you can see the mist begin to rise out of the, out of the jungle settings. And he says, come down here. Come down. And so I got down on the road. I actually put a little bucket down there and sat there next to him because I couldn't squat like that. I'm sitting down there right next to him, thigh to thigh, man. Here we were, looking out in the jungle, me and the communists. <laughs> and he said, Mr. Jeff, and of course, he's, this was serious, so he went through my translator. He says, Mr. Jeff, I need to tell you something. He said, I know why you're here. And I said, yes, sir, thank you. I'm glad you, you understand that. We're here to build schools and we're a compassionate ministry, and we do health care. My wife's a registered nurse, and, and we've, we've saved thousands of kids from sure death, from upper respiratory infection and diarrhea. Simple ailments in the States will kill kids, dead as a hammer overseas. I said, yeah, that's over. He says, no. And he did what is not typically Southeast Asian. He looked me in the eye, and he said, no, I know why you're here. And I got afraid. You ever been there? <laughs> Man, I got caught. <laughs> what a rotten missionary. Can't talk the language, don't know what I'm doing, and now I'm, I'm caught. And he said, I want to tell you something. He called me Ton Dove because he couldn't say Jeffrey really well. He didn't have a J in his language. But he says, Ton Dove, I need to tell you, you cannot do it. You cannot do it. You cannot speak about Christian religion. You cannot talk about Priyesu Krip. You cannot speak about Jesus, the Son of God. You are not allowed to do it. It's against the law, and we know why you're here. I had a really low moment at that point. He turned his head away, and he's looking back over the jungle, and where do you go from there? I mean, what do you do? You've been told by the guy that's tasked with watching you, you can't accomplish anything in this place. 
he reaches over, and again, we're in the middle of nowhere. I'm just trying to give you the setting for this story. This is not something I read out of Reader's Digest. This is me on the side of a hillside in northern Laos. He reaches over and puts his hand on the inside of my thigh. How of you know you had my attention? Full attention. I wondered, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> he put his hand on the inside of his thigh, and he says, I want you to make me a promise. And I said, yes, sir, I'm pretty willing to promise anything right now. He said, you can't do what you came to do now. But if you don't quit, if you don't quit, there will come a day when you're allowed to do what you came to do. And I stopped here on this side of the road to get your promise that when that day comes, you will know where my people live and that you will not forget them. The word he said in Lao was, don't forget to remember where they live and who my people are. He pointed across the, the vista of the jungle into a place where there were no, no hard-built roads, not even a road that a car could go on. They were donkey paths and foot paths in through the jungle. And he said, that area right there, in between Ban Kai and Mung Kham, that's where my village, that's where my tribal home is. Promise me, promise me you won't forget my people. I swore to a man who was not even in the kingdom of God that day, when I get the chance to make a difference, when I get an opportunity to do something significant for your people, I promise you I will. Fast forward almost 20 years later, this man had risen to the second highest position in the education department in the entire province, the northern half of Laos, actually. And Mr. Somjai was a very powerful and important man who became a very close friend of mine. Someone wanted his position. They poisoned his food slowly over the next several weeks. And as he was lying in his bed back home in Ponsawan, his wife and kids around him dying, they had said, there's nothing we can do to reverse it. You're dying. He made a phone call. By this time, I had moved out of Laos and had been in leadership in another place. But he called a young man. A pastor said, I... I robbed Rebecca from them. It's, if that's a theft, it's the best theft that's ever happened. I've done that with other young people around the country. Another young man and his wife, I talked them into doing something crazy for God, and they were able to learn the language and build another friendship with Somjai. He made a phone call down to the capital, and he says, Tan Paul, please come and tell me. I want to hear the story of Priyesu Krit Ben Pabu Paja. I want to hear the full story of Jesus, who is Christ, the Son of God. Paul got in his speed light land cruiser, and in a place where there is no speed limit, broke them all, <laughs> made it all the way up there before he passed away. And he said, Jeff, he said, through all the years we've worked together, I had the privilege of leading Somjai and his wife and his adult kids into the presence of the Savior Christ. And he died several days later. And I believe I will see my brother again in eternity. And I will thank him. I will thank him for making me promise to not forget the tribal people of the world. The Lisu people are tribal people, and that's the one we want to take an offering for this morning and promises, if you will, to try and help us finish that Bible for this group of people. They don't have the right to vote. They don't have the right to be a part of the army or to be a part of civil service. The companies will come in. The government will come in. They can be established in a place 40, 50 years, and they use the right of eminent domain take their village, take their land, take everything they've got. They just boot them because they have nothing. They're called stateless people. But these people are a people among whom the Spirit of God is moving and churches are being planted. Lives are being changed. The anointing of God is falling in that place. And I asked my brothers up and way up in the north, you look at it up on the map, see if you can find it. It's a place called Machina, northern Myanmar. It's uh, in the northern part of Burma, what we used to call Burma. I went there one day at their what they call the Bible school and and I'm looking, and I said, what can I do for your Bible school? Can I build you a dorm? Can I, can I finish the chapel for you? Can I raise funds to do this? And he said, oh, if you, could, if you could get us a Bible. If you could get us a Bible. Most of our students have never held their own personal copy of the Word of God. Bible school students using copies of copies of copies. I promised them on that day I would get them a Bible with all the attendant notes. We're about halfway through. Pastor asked you to give greatly last year, and we're going to ask you to do it again this year. For the promise that a tribal man asked of me, but also for the promise of our Savior, who said that this gospel will be preached across all the world 
and he invites us as his friends to be a part of that process. Aren't you glad he lets us be a part? For where two or more are agreed together as touching any one thing, what shall they have? They shall have it of the Father if they ask in Jesus' name. I'm asking the Father for a miracle of finance this morning and prayer support for the Lee Sioux Bible for the people of Southeast Asia. I'm going to ask if our ushers would prepare. We have a little response form I want to put in your hand before we take an offering this morning. Ushers, if you do that, ma'am, if you'll come to the piano and begin to play. Thank God for the souls that were saved this morning. Amen. Thank God for a church and a pastor that were sensitive to the Spirit of God that would lead in that, in that regard. This morning, we're going to do the rest of it. We're going to make sure other people get a chance to hear and other people. Just go ahead and put that in the hands of everyone, guys, and uh, make sure that everyone that wants one has one. This is your, and it'll take a minute for some of you to get to you, but this is what's called a faith promise form that you normally use for your annual church pledge for missions. Um, and that's how you support your missionaries. How many of you notice the TV screen in the foyer? Anyone here where you see the missionaries? Anyone at all? Anyone seen that? No, pastor seen it. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, there's one. There's someone. Yeah, okay. You're focused, I know. But my picture's out there, and I just want you to go see it after church, okay? And uh, you can see that in the last 10 years, I haven't lost a hair. <laughs> I lost it when I was 23, and it never came back. But you support missionaries through this enterprise of faith, promise, giving. That's the point I wanted to get at. And I, my picture's out there. You supported us for, oh, man, at least 20 years, huh, Pastor? Long, long time. Maybe 20, maybe more than 20 years now. 